Um, it is now time for our parent-specific programming. Um, I would like to introduce Dean Campbell for our typical challenges in your students' first year session. Uh, thank you all. Hello again. So um, this session talks a little bit about some of the challenges that your students may face uh, as they acclimate to college. Again, there are a lot of scenarios that we're gonna go over. It may not um, pertain to your student at all. There may be some things that your student will go through that uh, they will need some assistance with. It's not meant to scare you. It's basically to give you an overview of some of the challenges that students face as they uh, start their college career. And then we talk about some of the resources that are available to you and or your student uh, to make certain that they are successful in their time here at Forum. So um, I'm going to pull away from the mic for a minute here and I'm gonna ask Dr. Sarah Prasad to come up and introduce herself and talk a little bit about the next slide. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Sarika Prasad. I'm a psychologist at the Counseling and Psychological Services Center. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about how we help parents as well as students. But first, I wanted to go over a little bit about possible challenges that com could come up. I mean, this whole presentation is about challenges. Uh, but just like any big life change, whether it was the birth of your child or adoption or uh, marriage, whatever things you've gone through in your life, they've been really positive and fulfilling experiences. And on the other hand, there's always these little growing pains that come up. So if and when you do and you know experience some challenges with your student, just know it has nothing to do with you know, you're a bad parent or they're not a good kid or whatever. It's none of that. It's all a natural part of the process. So do anticipate there will be some challenges and also know that you have gotten through challenges with your child before. So if you can think about times when maybe they might have uh, not done well in a, on an exam or they didn't make it on like the soccer team or they didn't get you know, a part in the dance, at their dance class that they wanted. There were certain ways that your child reacted to that. Some become withdrawn, some become angry, some anxious, some maybe depressed, some need some space, some want you very close. And whatever that sort of pattern was, is likely how they will also respond to challenges as they come up now in college. So whether that is challenges in school or friendship issues or whatever it is, it will likely be, it will likely manifest in the same way. So whatever you did that helped them then will likely help now, but you might have to find a different form to provide that in. So you might not be able to hug them or kiss them the way you did before, but providing some level of support. Um, whether that's giving them a call and talking on the phone for a while, or maybe you treat them to some special food or something physical in that way, you'll find your ways to adapt. Uh, but just know that whatever worked before will likely continue to work now. Okay. So one of the things that I'd like to discuss is college academic work. A lot of our students are coming to us at the top of their class and what they come to realize once they're at Fordham is they're amongst the number of individuals who are, who are at the top of their class also. So some of your students are going to find the class is challenging initially, some of them not so much in that it may be some information that they've uh, seen before and it's not as challenging through this initial phase, but it will get harder as time goes on. In any case, it's getting your students to understand that they still need to uh, consider their schedule, still need to consider the fact that they're going to class two or three times a week, two and a half hours potentially uh, per class, but then being able to negotiate all the things that they need to do from an academic perspective, their social per social life perspective, but getting all of those things synced so that they're turning in their assignments on time, doing the papers as they need to do them and such. The one thing that they don't have is you kind of breathing over the neck every night to say, oh, have you done, have you done, have you done? Um, not the case. In most instances, a lot of our professors require that they come to class because it's a part of the class credit. But in some instances, that's not the case. So if they're going down that slippery path of not 
keeping up with the assignments and things of that nature, it can go awry real quick. But having said that, we have uh, uh, parameters in place to assist those students if they are finding difficulty. One of the things that, again, I like to uh, explain and express to you, this is a partnership. So you may be getting the information before us in some instances, and we may be getting the information before you in, some, in other times. So in those instances when we are sharing information back and forth, it's helpful so that we can keep the student on track and provide them with the resources that they need so that they can move forward and be successful. Grades, midterms, and finals. Again, we hit on a touch point here in that this the first midterm period of the first year, you're gonna find out where they are. You're gonna have an indicator of where students are uh, at that point. After that, not so much. So what does that mean? You need to have those conversations with your students relative to expectations in terms of what you will know about their grades because we're not allowed to give you that information. Inevitably, I'm gonna to talk to one of you and you're gonna tell me at some point, I paid a bill, you sure do. But, <laughs> but I can't give you that information. Your student has to share that information with you and the ability for you to get access to their grades and the information. So this is the time to start talking about what that's going to look like so that you're not surprised and you know what's going on and they're able to share that information. Sometimes it's just as simple as them, you know, pulling the information up and forwarding it to you. Some, want, some parents want more access, but again, that's having those conversations with your students prior to. Uh, they will have a schedule presented to them in terms of the timeline for when they will be taking midterms for the most part and also for their finals. And one of the considerations is the fact that if they have three finals on the same day, we can talk to the professors about rescheduling one of those because we don't want to overwhelm students. Some students are like, oh, it's fine, I can get through it. But again, we don't want them overwhelmed. If they find themselves in a situation or circumstance where they have uh, a number of finals, midterms, or whatever the case may be on the same day, it's working with their academic advisor and also their class team to figure out how they can uh, have a conversation with the professor to negotiate change in one of those uh, particular courses and or uh, finals, midterms, whatever the case may be. Safety concerns. We extensively are having conversations with your students even today, uh, but through the orientation process, we also overlap those conversations post-orientation with some of the uh, programs and initiatives that are sponsored by the resident assistants, the first year mentors, the commuter uh, first year mentors, all of these different individuals are touch points for your students to get acclimated to being within the campus community, but also negotiating the spaces outside of the university. One of our uh, standard, um, uh, um, excuse me, terms that we use is that uh, New York is our campus and it really is. We take advantage of the fact that we're in the city, but having said that, we also want students to know what they need to do in terms of being out in those spaces and how they can uh, make accommodation for when they're out. One of the things that you'll hear from my colleague later on when we have the panel presentation, but also your students will hear from me in particular when we go through our orientation uh, in August, is the fact that I will ask them at some point to pull out their cell phones and to put in the uh, telephone number for the public safety office. Because one of our things is we never want a student to be in a situation or circumstance where they feel that they're unsafe, they may have lost their wallet, their purse, or whatever the case may be, they may have lost contact with the friends that they started off with and find themselves without money. We will have them get in a cab. We don't worry about, oh, well, you know, you don't have money, come back, we'll get you here. The public safety office has monies to pay the cab, we'll settle out everything later on. We never want a student to be in a compromised situation where they can't get back to campus. So we will have those conversations also from a peer perspective because oftentimes hearing it from the peers in terms of what do they do? How do they uh, learn the city? How do they learn about going to other boroughs within the city if you're not uh, native to North Jersey, Connecticut or New York? Just some of the things that they need to be aware of. We really do uh, take our time to have different 
uh, possibilities for having those conversations with their students because it's not a one and done. Sometimes with all of this, it's overwhelming. I know it's overwhelming for some of us today to hear a lot of this information. And that's why we're gonna provide you with a resource at the end of this of numbers and contacts in case you have additional follow-up questions that you want to uh, address. Protests and free speech. We do allow students to protest. We encourage that because that's a part of the educational process also, but it's a process. So we will ask students to register to uh, let us know the dates, the times, things of that nature uh, relative to those types of events. So it's never a case that we deny students the opportunity to voice their opinions. We have a process and we just ask that they register so that one, we can have the uh, individuals in place like public safety, because if you have a large gathering of people, we wanna make sure that's a safe environment because sometimes you may have counter um, thoughts, processes, things that are individuals that are counter to what you uh, may be ex expressing as part of your protest. We wanna make sure that we have all safety measures in place. So it's not to prohibit free speech, not about that at all. We just wanna make sure that we're providing a safe environment for students to do so. Going home at break. So you're in for a rude awakening, some of you. <laughs> some, of you <laughs> some of you, not so much. In that, they are going to experience new things as a part of their college life. And so I say to parents, have those conversations often and early in terms of what your expectations are, because I can tell you inevitably when I went home to visit from DC, because I went to school in DC, I'm from North Jersey. And um, you know there was a club back then called Bentley's that we like to frequent. My friends were coming up from DC and Maryland, Virginia, the DMV to visit me. And, you know, I want to show off because, you know, I'm worldly from New York and New Jersey, you know, they didn't have it going on down there. And <laughs> so when I got in at about 4.30 or so in the morning, my mother was like, you must be out of your mind. <laughs> So I quickly learned that, no, I wasn't back on campus in Ryan Hall, which is where I lived my freshman year. I was back in Ms. Campbell's house and I needed to do what Ms. Campbell expected. So those conversations are what you expect, even from the perspective of not just the residential experience, but also our commuter parents that are here. You know, there may be certain uh, traditions that you have in terms of your expectations for students to be available for the family dinner on Wednesday, if that's a tradition in your household. It's having those conversations with your students about what the expectations are, because I'll go a little further into the presentation uh, to note that a lot of our commuter students are very heavily involved in our student activities here on campus. Uh, parents, individuals will make the assumption, oh, it must be the residential population that's really involved. Our commuters are very involved. They're student leaders, they're in leadership positions, so they're very active on campus. And I pride myself in that being the case because we have made an effort to make certain that we have commuter friendly times for our students to be engaged. Having said that, then they need to negotiate some of those conversations with you in terms of you know, what they're engaged in and what they're doing uh, during their course uh, here at uh, Fordham University. Melissa, I need your help. I messed something up. I'm not the techie person, I tell the world. Just give me one moment, please. I don't know, it just disappeared. <laughs> okay, thank you, dear. You're welcome. I appreciate it. In terms of the commute, again, I kind of dovetailed and talked about this a little bit. But um, there are commuter grants and things of that nature that are available to your students, but also those conversations with your students about expectations. We, again, have friendly times for our commuters to be here. We have the garden space here in uh, the 140 building. We really expanded the opportunities for students to be here and have a living room of sorts so that they don't have to necessarily rush home. So there's a place for them to be, but also we do a lot of overlap in terms of our commuters and our residents being able to engage in activities with each other because we want them to get to know their class and their classmates. So it's not relegated to just the commuters versus residents. We really are about, the, about combining efforts and making certain that we have those opportunities for them to get to know each other across the spectrum. So one of the things that some of our students will experience is the uh, aspect of being homesick. 
uh, we try again to make certain that we find some niche for your students to be engaged in so that they feel a part of the fabric of the university. The RAs, the CFMs, the uh, resident freshmen, first year mentors, they're very involved in trying to get to know your student on an individual basis because some of our students come to us very gregarious and outgoing and we have some introverts. I can tell you I wasn't an introvert, or can't you tell? <laughs> but we want to speak to all aspects of our students' personalities. So we make certain that we are reaching out to all of our students to make certain that we can find something that they may be interested in uh, getting engaged in. Uh, one of the things that I often turn to is like the gaming guild. Years ago, it's like, what is a gaming guild and what are they going to do? But the gamers came out and they were like, look, we really are interested in this. Can we form a club? And that's what they did. And so sometimes you'll find a student, that's the only thing they want to do. And I'm, I'm good with that because they're engaged at some level. But uh, one of the things we want to encourage your students to do within those first couple of weeks, we offer the club and organization fair so, they, so that they can get to know about the various activities that are available. As a resident, they are already a part of the Residence Hall Association, which is the governing body within the residential hall community in that they have um, positions for first year students even coming through the door that they can be involved in. And we encourage that heavily for the students to find something that they want to do with, within those parameters of the clubs and organizations that are throughout the campus community. I'm going to ask Melissa to come up. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, this is loud. Uh, my name is Melissa Gazal, and I'm the Assistant Director for Programming and Coordinator for Alcohol and Other Drug Education here at Fordham University's Lincoln Center campus. Um, if it's of any consolation to all the parents in the room and those on the screen, um, and I'm, I'm an FCLC alum myself, and I was a commuter student, and I loved the university so much I came back voluntarily to work here. So um, you are in good hands. And I'm going to go into a little bit about another conversation you might be having with your students, which is the fun stuff of alcohol and other drug education. Um, so what we really try to do with um, alcohol and other drug education here at Fordham University is putting out this, you know, everyone thinks that you come to college, you're going to party, you're going to drink, you're going to do whatever, you're going to have a great time. You are going to have a great time, but it doesn't necessarily have to revolve around drugs and alcohol. So as you can see on the screen, we have some survey results. And this was from our biannual core and alcohol, um, core, excuse me, core alcohol and drug survey that we just administered in spring 2021. And we had about 31% of um, a response rate from our students because, you know, lots of things are going on. Um, and as you can see from the survey results, so 75% of Fordham students believe that the average student on campus uses alcohol once a week or more, when in reality, according to those who responded, 61% of Fordham students that had, con had consumed alcohol in the last 30 days. So again, it's not everyone coming to college, drinking, et cetera. Talking a little bit about cannabis usage. So um, again, using the same survey, 31% um, response rate, 43.5% of Fordham students have used cannabis at least once in the last year, and about 27% were reported uh, cannabis users at the time. And about 32% of Fordham students who use cannabis reported that they had started using cannabis um, prior to coming to college. So the tricky thing with cannabis moving forward um, in the fall semester is that um, it is legal in New York State recreationally. However, because it's not legal at the federal level and we have to follow federal laws, um, cannabis is not allowed on campus grounds. So that's another conversation you might want to have with your student. We'll be having those conversations with your students as they come to college as well. So what do we do about all of this? So we have a multi-tiered approach to alcohol and other drug education, as I mentioned. Um, first, starting with programming and campus culture. So, um, excuse me, so we, um, apologies my notes. Um, so all of our programming is substance-free, anything from you know, commuter programs to residential programs, all of our programming is substance-free. We work on prevention and risk reduction techniques through email campaigns that has high risk times of the year, as well as flyer campaigns and social media campaign, campaigns at high risk times of the year, just making sure that students are practicing safe drinking habits, they're not doing five shots in one hour, et cetera, just making sure that they are safe. Our education programming begins before your student even gets to campus. In the next few weeks, you'll be receiving an email as well as your student 
Um, so with some information about our alcohol EDU course that is mandated for all students coming into Fordham. And we also have um, a student health and wellness organization called Be Well LC, and they'll be doing programming throughout the academic year with like, not even just relation to alcohol and other drug education, but talking about nutrition and stress management. And then lastly, we have our student conduct piece. So sometimes it happens, you know, knock on wood, hopefully not very frequently, um, but <laughs> violations of our alcohol, other drug policy are reported and result in appropriate adjudication. It's really just a conversation. We wanna make sure that your student's safe. Um, and sometimes that'll happen, but hopefully it does not. And I will turn it back over to Dr. Prasad. All right, so there will be some normal changes that happen uh, while your child is in, in college. As they come to interact with new people, there will be some new interests and there might be some, uh, I'll talk more about changes in mood and things like that that happen at this age. So a certain amount of changes is, is normal, but when you see significant or consistent changes in behavior, that's when I would consider it a warning sign. So for example, it's a normal human experience that after um, a breakup, for example, you feel sad for a few days or even a few weeks. If it was a really important relationship, there's a certain type of grief that someone might experience. But for somebody to be thinking about um, hurting themselves or another person due to a breakup is not within the usual realm of behavior after a breakup. So that would be a very significant change. And especially if it was something that they were thinking about for a longer amount of time, that would be a consistent change. Or there could be something that looks a little bit uh, subtle, like maybe they have stopped uh, doing things that you know that they're interested in. So you know that they usually like dance and they like music. And then suddenly, you know, over time, they're stopping doing those things and they're becoming more and more isolated. That's something that would be an example of a consistent change over time that you notice. So the first step I would recommend is that you speak to your child about it, not in a judgmental or accusatory tone, just this is something I noticed. Uh, you know, what's going on here? What do you think is going on? Is there some way I can support you? But if you're finding that the change is significant enough or there is enough concern on your end, you can also reach out to counseling and psychological services. We do um, consultations with parents pretty regularly. So you can call our office, explain the situation to us, and we would be happy to help you out and give, help you out with um, either speaking to the student or just give you some advice to help manage the situation. So we get back to the, how can I get involved? A lot of that, I, as I shared already, is communicating if you know something that's going on with your student. Oftentimes there may be changes in the home situation. There may be you know, a death in the family. There may be a breakup that the student is having that we may not be aware of at that point in time we might be able to help and assist in that way because we'll use all of our partners, again, which uh, they will be here for a panel later on, but to provide you with some resources at the end of this presentation that we can reach out to be at campus ministry, be at disability and support services if there's some glitch that the student is having in terms of their studies, going to the writing center, any number of different things may be uh, problematic for the student, but utilize, utilizing us as a resource so that we can get you to the right direction and then work with your student to help them get through whatever phase it is that they're going through. So that's the way, again, that partnership will work between you and us in terms of communication and keeping those lines open. Roommate problems, roommate problems. For some of you, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming to me, <laughs> but it's all a good thing. From the perspective, we have a lot of different interventions that we utilize. One of the things that I tell parents without question, um, we always want our sons or daughters, especially those that aren't the neatest in the world, put down that you're going to be me. If they're not needed home now, they're not going to be neat when they come to afford them. So please don't put them in that situation. We're going to find the perfect person for them. And not saying that we have pig, pig size lair here, you know, or anything of that nature. It's 
getting students to understand what, what they need to go negotiate in terms of the space. So having said that, we have some very super intensive students that want everything in its place. And guess what? The algorithm has been able to find those folks when they honestly put down what it is on those questionnaires that the students filled out. It matches them. It's amazing. Um, I always have the uh, case sometimes where folks want to be besties and they got they have to get the same comforter and the same uh, drapery and all that good stuff. And again, in October, I'm hearing from you because now they can't stand each other. They were the best friends in high schools. And I tell students, you may not want to live with your besties. Living with something is a totally different animal. Maintain your friendship with that person at a distance because sometimes the living together brings out another aspect of your relationship that you may not want to uh, see come to fruition. As it relates to what we do to intervene, we have mediations and I say the resident assistants and the uh, first year mentors are the kings and queens of mediation because they can have these conversations with, with their students to negotiate the space and figure things out. Another intervention that we use uh, prior to the uh, students getting uh, so far into the weeds that they're not pointing out the things that they want to have as part of their living environment is that we have them complete a roommate contract. And that keeps everybody kind of authentic and honest in terms of what it is they want to have happen in the environment. And I think it's helpful when they can have those conversations and I always tell students be your authentic self. If there's something, again, that you don't wanna share, say it because oftentimes when we get into these mediation conflict resolutions with students, Bill is saying, well, yeah, I borrowed a red shirt for the last month and a half, but he never said anything. So how was he supposed to know it was a problem for him to borrow the red shirt when you haven't shared that? Because we go into this wanting to be nice and friendly and all those good things, and that sometimes makes things go right. I'll share a story with you again. I'm, a, I'm the story queen. When I went to school, the one factor that was not a point of negotiation for me at all was someone sitting on my bed. I didn't want anyone except me <laughs> sitting on my bed because your bum and my head, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't get with that. I just, <laughs> I just had a problem with that. You know, we had chairs in the room that would sit on the chair, not on my bed. So, you know, for me, that was my authentic self with my roommate and it all worked out beautiful. She never had anyone sit on my bed. Before. Good. So I share that with you when your students are starting this process of getting their roommate information, when they're saying oh, about the cleaning schedule, when they're talking about who's bringing laundry detergent versus who's bringing, a lot of times students are negotiating those things. Who's gonna bring the toilet paper? You know, all of those conversations they need to start having with each other now so that they can circumvent some of the things in the future. But if we get to a bump in the road, we do have some interventions in place to help them get past that. Managing time. Managing time is not only as it relates to their academics, but also their social life. You know, if they have a job, you know, all of those things, it's looking at a schedule. And oftentimes I'll suggest to a student, you can use your phone, you know, with those little calendars and things on it. Sometimes I have students that really like the old fashioned way of writing it down in a book because it, you know, they like the lists and things of that nature. It's getting them into the habit of doing those things because again, you're not going to be there as mom, dad, guardian to remind them, you know, you had that such and such and such to do. They, it's moving really swiftly with them between classes and other responsibilities. It's getting them to understand that they need to start, you know, writing down what it is that they need to do so that they can stay on top of all of the different activities that they're engaged in, but also for the studies. Managing money. Are they gonna have money? Are they gonna have a job? Are you giving them a certain uh, allowance uh, relative to what they need to spend? Uh, what is that going to look like? Again, having those conversations before they go, because within this area of Fordham, I can tell you, having been in the role of the Senior Director of Residential Life, I can't tell you how many folks come through in terms of delivery services. We have all kinds of food in this area. If you want Greek, you want Italian, you want you know, uh, food from Jamaica, it, it, it just runs the gamut in terms of what you can get can get. Having said that, it can get very expensive also. So they need to start talking about what they're going to do with the money 
if they have money, but also the next screen talks about what to do if you don't have money. And what are some of those things that you can do? There are a lot of jobs that are available to our students. So if they have not gotten work study, for example, the RAM then hires a number of students. We have other offices that have uh, part-time positions for students. Also take advantage of career services and we'll have a representative, Holly, from career services because if a student is looking for employment, we have a lot of employers that reach out to us, both uh, those that are connected to the university in terms of alum, but also other organizations that know Fordham produces quality individuals who wanna work so they can take advantage of those opportunities too. They're going to, in some instances, create new identities and you're going to look around when Thanksgiving comes and you're like, well, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> who is that? <laughs> That's your little baby, you know, come back <laughs> to visit in a different form. No. But, you know, they're going to go through some of those changes in identity, they're going to experience different things. And again, it's talking about, you know, expectations in terms of what you're expecting in the household, but also being open to them sharing information and sharing the fact that they're evolving and changing because that's part of the uh, process of growth and development that there may be some changes in terms of their personality, in terms of the things that they like. They may come home and tell you, I don't want another piece of chicken ever in life. Well, you know, they've been exposed and now they're vegan, you know, so those are some, <laughs> some of the things that, you know, you need to uh, consider in terms of those identity changes and such with your children. Fitting in and making friends. Some of our students, again, are gonna come through these doors like a, a, a wind burst. And, you know, they have all the friends in the world. You, you can't even count them on two sets of hands, less more one. And then we'll have a student that's struggling. You know, they're a little shy. They, you know, aren't, you know, getting the vibe. And that's part of the process. They're going to call you in some instances, even those that are, were outgoing in high school. And you're like, what happened? It's a different environment. It's getting to know they're here in a different city. They may be coming to us from the West Coast and the East Coast vibe is a little different. They may be coming to us from Texas and the Texas vibe is a little different. All of those things are a part of the growth process. Give it a chance. But if you definitely see something as Dr. Prasad mentioned earlier, that's just a little off and you're like, you know, you're really concerned, let us know. Let us figure out how we can partner together to figure out what's going on with your student and provide some resources for them. Um, again, uh, I always say, I love the fact that here at Lincoln Center, we have that extra uh, paraprofessional staff member that's available to your students. So not only do we have a resident assistant, but we have the commuter first year mentor, and we also have the resident first year mentor. So that's an extra set of eyes and individuals that can handhold and, and get your students through this process of getting to know each other. So. We like for those students to really be in there and get their hands and roll up their sleeves and get their uh, hands dirty to really work with your students and, and figure out how they can make connections between a uh, different number of students, but also to find out what your student is interested in so that they can present them with, oh, you know what, you might wanna join this club, or this person I know uh, has that same interest. You may wanna meet John and you know have some conversation. So uh, I know all of you parents here are going to want to provide support to your students, but what support looks like in young adulthood is different than in childhood. However, there are still some uh, principles from infancy and childhood that you can keep in mind. So what I mean by that is uh, when your child was first born, it was a baby, it was probably very normal and appropriate for you to have your baby physically with you uh, at all times or you know, always to be supervising and making sure the child is eating enough. And if they're crying that you respond or whatever, you had some method for it. And then as they got a little bit older, then it was normal for the child to play, um, you know, on the floor and then to be able to crawl around the room and then, you know, run around the house, but they have to stay in the house or in, um, in the yard. And then at some point ride their bike. But there was always that relationship where if they look back they know that you're there but they also have freedom to explore just like in the playground you might sit on a bench 
And so they know you're around if they need you, but they still can go just try the swings or try to play tag or whatever it is. So at this age, try to keep that same thing in mind. There is a way for you to continue having some emotional presence and even physical presence in their life that's appropriate for this age and also allow them the space to figure some things out for themselves. Um, there are going to be times where they go through certain struggles and you'll really want to be there very close to like fix things and help things help them through, but they need a little bit of space sometimes to go through those feelings, actually feel them and get through. And now that they know they've survived it, they know they could do it again. Just like some of you might have experienced in your life, you've been through something very painful. And because you've been through that painful thing, when something else comes up, you know, I can survive this too. And also there is a certain level of support you still do want to give. You don't wanna be so distant and like hands off that if they do need help, they are afraid to approach you. So this is an ongoing conversation to have with students about what support looks like and what feels good to them. Um, and um, what was I gonna say about this? Right, oh, so there's cultural differences too. So in some people's cultures, you know, it is going to be appropriate for you to maybe see them more often or be more hands-on other cultures are different. So definitely talk to other parents who have had college age students in your cultural group or who currently have students who are around your children's age and just see kind of what works, what doesn't work, find support in your own peer circles. Uh, this is as difficult for parents as it could be for students. So Dr. Prasad basically went over some of the exploring independence, so I won't uh, belabor that point. But the next one in terms of limitations and ramifications, without question, some of your students are going to get engaged in some activity that is counter to what it is we come to expect. So that brings into part to play the student conduct process. Again, one of my theories is I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. In that, we're gonna have those conversations with your student because we start without question from the perspective of what was your motivation for coming to Fordham in the first place? Trying to you know, unpack a little bit of where they are and what's causing the behavior to be counter to what it is we're expecting. Uh, one of the things that I really, again, enjoy about being at a Jesuit Catholic institution is the fact that I can have those conversations with you. Um, again, you're not hearing at the 11th hour that John is being asked to leave the institution. You know right along with us where we are in the process um, in terms of working with your student and getting them to a space where they need to be in terms of some of those positive outcomes that we're looking for. I'm going to, and the I is either my staff or myself, we're going to be in communication with you. If we get to a point where the behavior is so egregious that I have to say, mm, guess what, John needs to come home with you for a little bit because he can't live in community right now. I'm going to be honest about that, but it won't be at the 11th hour that you don't know exactly what's going on. So we, again, are going to work within the framework of being in touch with each other and making sure that you know exactly what's going on. What we encourage students to do when we are at a point where they may be engaged in a student conduct situation, that first initial conversation that we're having, you need to inform your parents that they will be hearing from us so that you know exactly what's going on. Because again, that's getting them to the mature process of being able to have an adult conversation with you. You know, you're a young adult, you're going to take responsibility for what it is that you've done. So you now need to have that conversation with your parents in terms of what the next steps are and what your understanding is of the process. So again, those open lines of communication are going to be made available to you so that you're not surprised in the end relative to something that's going on with your student. Uh, so in general, in terms of seeking help, we do want to normalize that for students. A lot of people come in feeling, no matter where you're from, a lot of people have this belief that if I ask for help, I'm weak. But actually, um, the reality is that if you're a person who needs to like have these walls up around them in order to feel safe, you are less courageous and less brave than the person who can stand on their own in their vulnerability and show people, yes, I need help. 
So actually seeking help shows that you're courageous. You know what to do. When you need help, you can find it and you can ask for it. I know how to be somebody who exists as um, you know, a healthy level of dependence with people around me. So we do want to encourage help seeking, but we'll speak about more specific ways that that can happen in the Fordham community, whether it's through mental health or seeking help from professors, et cetera. So, right, it's just a little comic. It says, could we up the dosage? I still have feelings. This is, this is how a lot of people feel. That, you know, we think that in order to, to feel better, we won't have feelings anymore. That's not true. The beauty and the color of living life as a human being is feeling things. And uh, the way that feelings work is if you push one down, actually they all kind of get numbed down and pushed down. So we wanna encourage people to feel what they have to feel, whether it's actually anxiety or fear or happiness or joy to be able to sit with them, um, not to teach them to stop feeling things. So that also brings me to our next point that there are going to be times where those feelings become very intense, emotions become intense, anxieties, tensions, or even existing mental health concerns become a little more intense. And as I said before, when it's a um, consistent or significant change, that's when it might be time to seek help from a mental health professional. But even before that, you know, Therapy can help everyone. It really aids people in self-exploration and understanding the self. But um, what I do want to highlight is that whether it's for a physical ailment or mental illness or any sort of treatment or support that your student currently has, I really strongly recommend that you continue that. Um, starting school is not the time to stop going to therapy or to stop taking a medication. You really should be continuing the existing supports at least for, I usually recommend two, two semesters or one year. And then maybe you will think about reevaluating unless of course your, your primary provider you know, suggests otherwise. But as I said, this is a big transition and that can mean that certain um, symptoms flare up again or that certain challenges come up that increase stress on the individual. So if someone is going to therapy once a week, they should continue going to therapy once a week. If they're taking certain medication, they should continue that. Um, oh, also I wanted to note that, uh, so while at the counseling center, we provide short-term services, um, those short-term services are not appropriate for every student, depending on what they might be presenting with. We do evaluations to determine that. So if, um, your student needs long-term psychiatric or mental health care, we also provide referrals into the community and we work with, with parents with insurance or location or whatever you need help with. So also I want to, to talk about normalizing counseling and what actually happens in counseling because this is something a lot of young people are seeking nowadays. We have huge demand at the uh, at CPS. So um, what happens when someone sees a psychologist, when someone sees me is, well, first of all, I don't tell people hate their parents. I get that a lot from parents. They think that I'm telling their student to like blame all their problems on their parents. That's not what happens. Uh, I love parents, <laughs> but uh, really we work together as a team. So I have specific training. I have a lot of student loans related to this training um, that is in, you know, research and clinically understanding mental illness and how different stressors impact uh, young people. But I don't know your child. So while I might be able to tell somebody who is struggling with depression, you know, this type of therapy can work or maybe it's due to this stress on you or you need to change your sleep hygiene or this medication will work, you know, I have that. What you might be able to tell the student is something like, hey, you know, I noticed that you um, stopped taking your singing lessons and you love singing. Maybe doing that again will help you. Or you can tell, you know, hey, you know, I guess maybe you didn't realize, but you started feeling depressed after our, our pet died at home. Do you think maybe that's related? So, you know, you have some insight that I'd, I'm not going to know about the pit or I'm not going to know about the singing lessons that you know your child better than we do. So we have to work together as a team, but there are certain times that, you know, people who are therapists and people who are doctors do are able to provide certain expertise that could be helpful.
So I encourage you at this point to take out those cameras and cell phones and take a picture of uh, the resources that are listed here. So these are a number of the partners that I mentioned during the talk and conversation. Uh, basically individuals that will be able to assist your students as they go through their tenure here at Fordham. But if there's ever a situation where you're not certain of who you need to contact, you can always reach out to me and I can direct you to the individuals who can assist you. We'll leave this up as the next panel comes in to uh, convene because a lot of these folks are represented in this next panel and can be able or will be able to answer some of your specific questions uh, relative to their areas of responsibility. Thank you so much for your indulgence and listening and I appreciate your time. So I'll be around, I'm not going anywhere.